Amber said it'll be grond. Good morning, good morning, everybody. On here, okay. But I believe you're online. I got to stand here. Good morning, everybody. My name is Francois. I'm on the exco of uh, the Western Cape Beekeeping Association. My uh, portfolio is honey, and then I do a bit of recruitment as well. So we put a few years in, and I do a bit of to recruit for the organisation. Before I start, I would like to thank uh, the Western Cape Department of Agriculture for allowing us to use their facility and they're also sponsoring the day, the coffee, the tea and later the eats that we're going to have. So Charles, thank you very much for that. Thanks for your, your willingness to help us, to assist us. I think there's a big appreciation for, from the Western Cape Beekeeping Association uh, together with us the, uh, or together with the, the Western Cape Department of Agriculture to take uh, apiculture forward as part of agriculture in the Western Cape, specifically supporting our um, fruit growers in the area. I just need to read something, and I've tried to memorize, but it's a bit long. And you can find this on our website. But before I start, I just need to introduce some of our executive members here. Our chairperson, Reet Van Sale is here. Ferry is sitting there. And we got Lynn in front, she acts in front at, at the desk, welcoming desk. She all, she's also here. Some of the other guys couldn't be here today. And obviously, as I said, i am uh, got to do with honey production and assisting honey producers. If you go onto our website, uh, specifically on the honey side, you will read the following. Honey has been humankind post potent sources of, uh, potent source of sweetness since ancient times. In our Western Cape, ancient rock art from thousands of years ago depicts early hunter-gatherer uh, societies raiding bees' nests. But the sweetness of honey aside, it's the spectrum of colors and the array of flavors that food lovers also find pleasing. Our local beekeepers, as local beekeepers, the owners is on us to ensure that honey produced in the Western Cape it's a true re reflection of the complexity, goodness, and tastiness of <laughs> by our famed indigenous bees and flora. Most of the honey in our country uh, is imported. We, um, we use about 8,000 tons a year, of which we in South Africa produce about 2,000 tons. The rest are imported from China, predominantly China. And then these imported honeys, they, we sometimes find they, adul they adulterate it. They add on extra uh, substances to get their volumes off and then up and then it also irradiate it. And uh, that means to uh, expose it to gamma rays to kill microorganisms. So what we import is not really pure honey. So today we're going to talk about our products, our South African honey, specifically in this area. Uh, we've asked Ahmad uh, to do the main presentation. And uh, what we found is that if we uh, do add-ons, like with honey, your 
your honey and your wax is, I would say, uh, the primary products. And then obviously when you look at candle making, um, other things like food, um, and then we add some honey or we add some um, wax, beeswax, and we can call that the secondary products. And that is what Ahmed will talk about. We also believe that uh, we need to uh, make our honey producers, our beekeepers, that solely look at honey. Ons moet hulle meer, we got to make them more profitable. Ons moet hulle meer volhoubaar maak. So dis wat ons doen, om hierdie gekies te vertel, en lekker open sessies te heer, ons kan lekker los praat, en ons kan die vraag vraag, so dat ons kan weggaan, want ons glo dat, boon maal die jening uh, op sig self, um, kan hier een redelijke presentatie by u wens maar gevoeg, wanneer hier hierdie goed doen. So vandag is dit wat ons gaan doen, jy moet lekker met open gemoed inwees, en uh, Charles, ek gaan dan aan hom oorlaat, om uh, voor te gaan met die program. Baie dankie. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It's nice to always see so many beekeepers get together like this. It's very inspiring. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit in general um, because I don't want to cover other people's topics. But I found very inspiring when I was in Australia the amount of beekeepers that go to farmers markets and Saturday <coughs> markets and the vast array of products that they have on sale. And uh, when, we, when we look in South Africa, when we go to farm stalls and things like that, um, generally what we, what we see is this. Just, that's all it is. It's 60 rand. Well, 60 rand... I don't know. Sometimes I think I might not buy it because it might be a little bit suspect. There's no story here. When you look at another jar of honey that has, okay, this is not promoting us, but it's a gift for somebody. But you've got a label that's fully compliant and it tells a little bit of a story. A consumer of a middle class income is... 85% of the time going to buy that because an element of trust that goes with telling a story. This, the beekeeper, is not in the farm store to tell you the story. Someone tells you, oh, it comes from the farm across the road. Well, there's not much traceability there. We don't even know if he's a registered or compliant beekeeper. So that's your first offset, in my mind, to increase your price. Now, if we look at another thing, let's just go back to the little honeybees we worked out yesterday. We all know that it takes 12 honeybees to make a teaspoon of honey, which is 500 mils, which is seven, uh, seven grams. Sorry, five grams, seven grams. So basically, for every jar of honey that a consumer buys, 800 bees gave their lives to make that jar. That makes it one hell of a precious commodity. If you had to put the minimum wage 
to something like that, uh, honey would be running it over 200 rand a jar. That said, if I look at South African honey and the awards that it wins, and uh, honey that I took to Australia, which was very mediocre, average honey, um, nothing spectacular, none of Mike McIntyre's sugar gum, um, Downey Forster's um, Feinbos honey from down your can't buy, just very average honey. And although they got a diversity of honey in Australia, and really you got red box, grey box, brown box, you got yellow gum, you got yellow box, and it goes on and on and on, and they're superb. And yet the beekeepers that, and you are able to get, we were able to get honey in, we did declare it, uh, because it was gifts, and they were blown away by the taste of our honey. So somebody somewhere along the line, and I, maybe they are doing it already quietly, there's, there is such an export market for South African honey, but we also know there's a resistance to price because of what comes into the country. Whether it comes in through SADC countries or directly, we're up against that kind of thing. So how do we, com how do we combat that and how do we get consumers to pay us a worthy price for our honey. It can only be one way, it's through education. And the other way to do it is by telling your story, by letting consumers know that in, a, in fact, if you want to go in the simplistic terms, it takes 800 bees to make a 500 gram a jo uh, jar of honey. So get that across to the consumers. The next thing, if we, so we look at the, the bottling, um, the quality of the container has an impact on your price, the labeling and the compliance of the labeling and the story that goes with the labeling. Unbelievable. I saw honey the other day, I think it was a 375 gram jar. Uh, I'm not used to speaking to beekeepers, so I'm a little bit nervous. I'm normally speaking to the uneducated public and trying to educate them. And... Um, there was a 375 gram jar of honey at 158 rand. And someone said, oh, that's expensive. I said, no, it's not. Look at the story on this. We, we can track this beekeeper down and maybe we can go and visit his farm. And that's how you get your market, in my opinion. I'm not a marketing person at all. I, in fact, IT is terrible. Ask Charles is a very advanced on the IT side. <laughs> um, so that's the one thing and then we get to all the other products like you'll see I mean these people here Jeff and Casey Bloom they uh, um, I'm trying to think of the valley near PE and I was asked to do a talk out in the crags and like a honey tasting where local beekeepers would bring their honey and um, people always go but why do you why do you do that if you sell your honey in that area? Well, why not? Why not? You just help everybody bring up their beekeeping standard and we all move up together. There's none of this. You know, when I started 18 years ago um, in Nisner and I offered commercial guys in Georgia, I said, hey, here's a long wheel Toyota Raider Bucky. You got me. I'm still young and, and strong and uh, free diesel, free labor. And eventually my partner said after six months, stop pestering these guys. It's very clear they don't want you to see their operation. I kind of feel the other way around. The more that you uh, encompass and bring in other beekeepers and help them, the more you up the overall standard. Um, I was asked to do a little talk to Victoria Beekeeping Association in, in Melbourne online. Um, uh, there was something like almost 300, and that's Melbourne. Uh, Melbourne's not much bigger than the city of Cape Town from what I could see. And yet everybody was in, and uh, they all wanted to learn. And the more we learn and share together, the more we up the standard. And what's the, what's the ripple effect? The better our price becomes, and the more, more sustainable we become. Um, so that's, that's just my five cents worth on that. Um, if we, look at, if we look at the products, um, one thing I noticed is that we have to be very careful on what, if we look at the side product, because there's nothing from a beehive that cannot be used. Even slum gum 
dried out, mixed with sawdust uh, and paraffin and squashed into little blocks, the, however you want to do it, becomes a perfect fire lighter. So imagine your brand so-and-so's fire lighters in a farm store somewhere, people buy that. The candles, the healing bombs, our healing bombs with our propolis are amazing. I had an operation in 2018 um, which required quite a bit of like medication, which I threw away after two days because it's not, not my thing. Uh, like any beekeeper, we believe honey and the products heal everything. So then you put your, you know, your money where your mouth is. And um, when I went back to the surgeon <coughs> after 10 days, he couldn't believe how fast the scar where the stitches were was healing. And I said to him, well, here's your packet of your things because I'm, I'm not going to. And this is a potential. And there's so much research that's been done. We often notice, like Mike Alsop will ask for samples of honey for some other. Maybe it's Joburg University. Maybe it's UCT. And it's quite astounding how few beekeepers respond uh, and send, even though it's a little bit of effort. But the wonderful thing, like if we look at Janaeus Dalport at UCT, uh, doing pollen analysis is that by helping the science it comes back to you. We're already starting to get the details of some of our of some of the honeys we sent in um, loosely, but it, uh, just a generalisation at this moment. But we'll get more accurate, and then we're going to share with those beekeepers who input it. And imagine being able to put the source, the actual source, not a mm, they were working on the carry gums kind of thing, so we'll call it carry gum, but the actual source within a few percentage of what your bees are worked on. That again elevates your price. So helping the science, we're waiting for the thing on the, people might remember Mike also asking for honey for ulcer research. I think it was University of Johannesburg or Pretoria. We will get feedback from that. So if you contribute to the science, comes back to you you're able to use it in your marketing, or if you call it marketing, or your labeling. Um, the most important thing is, is, is don't make uh, claims on your labeling that you can't substantiate through a scientific proof. And the, and the very important thing is that, you know, one thing with that, and I mean, there's thousands of researchers. I was going through them. We even got researchers that are now bringing all different researchers together and then refining it down into uh, more uh, uh, condensed versions. But we also got to be careful when you just claim things, um, you could be wrong. And one thing I picked up that is significantly pro scientifically proven that there are large variations in antimicrobial activity of some natural honeys. So you got to be careful. You're claiming, oh, it's organic. Well, I hope you're certified. I saw sachets of honey the other day. It was advertised on Marketplace as organic. Mm, no substantiating, no organic certification. Um, and then just asked a few questions out of interest, but got no reply. So you've got that side of things where people just, ah, you know, organic honey sells for better. Some just call it organic. Just be honest with your product because if you've, if you give the public your honesty and integrity, then straight away your price goes up. And that can be reflected in your labeling. It can be, uh, it can be effective in the way that people say, oh, can we just pop into your honey premises? Yeah, sure, come check the spinning room. Come look at our process. There, there's a, we, you don't need a health certificate for raw honey, but hey, we got one, you know? And when you do that, your price really gets elevated because our, our, honey, our honey prices in South Africa are just crazy, crazy low for the real deal. And as um, Francois was saying just now, you know, we, we use 8,000 tons of honey in South Africa a year, which we only produce or which we provide 2,000 tons, which sounds substantially low. Um, so then, you know, one's got to be, you have to tell the story. Most honeys don't tell the story and make sure your label's compliant. As we drove down, Krista and I actually, <laughs> we got here by default because we're staying in Aurora, which is a lacquer placky. And then I said to Rhett, we'll shoot down. And they said, okay, you need to talk for 
two minutes. I said, okay, we'll do that. Um, but a whole thing, even going, I mean, I can understand this guy. This honey comes from Wuppertal, the beautiful beekeeper. His name is Llewellyn. He loves his bees. And there, you know, someone could go and help him with a label. So we also got to help each other as well. Uh, that labels become compliant. Very lovely honey, by the way. Um, trademarks. If you become a medium business and you, and you find your business is really growing, you, you, you should trademark your label. Um, I think some people will be aware of the honey business in Hilton, uh, where the husband passed away and the wife wasn't really able to run the business for two years. She got it up and going again, only to find that fruit and veg had taken a name. And that was a whole long court case. So trademarking labels becoming a, a very, very big thing. Um, by the way, our trademark was pending, just in case anybody gets an idea. But I don't think you want the name. Um, and then when you, if you put things on your labels, it, it say it's propolis tinctures, which are amazing things. And healing balms with beeswax and propolis and certain essential oils, they work. And try them on your on yourself. I mean, Worm Nico will probably tell you, and he, he's probably scratched his hands. We all do all the time if we're working with bees, and you scratch and you cut, and it's either honey or your wife, or you've made a, a little bomb and you put on, and nothing actually heals as fast as that. It's amazing, and and the public out there today are starting to and respect to pharmaceutical companies and pharmacological comp companies. But consumers are moving back towards more natural products. They're also moving back towards buying directly from the producer. This is happening very much around the world. It's a good time to take advantage of it. Um, but you need to make sure that what you put on your label is not some airy fairy thing from Happy Bees or whatever, um, some half-baked thing. You need to make sure that whatever goes on your label is scientifically proven. So when you start making products, you need to actually do serious research. You've got to back it. You've got to be very careful of liability. Um, and I looked at, um, so anyway, this thing in, the, this thing in, in um, a little honey tasting thing in the crags, and there are a lot of beekeepers are surprised. We always use that as an opportunity to tell beekeepers that they have to be registered with Delrid. You know, you can't expect uh, any, any help from, from government if they see two beekeepers in the Western Cape are registered. And, I mean, we've got to have Western Cape Department of Agriculture for the first time ever. We're seeing they're really backing the beekeeping industry. And this is amazing. I mean, Charles is an amazing guy. You can call him any time, day at night. He's on the road from one farm to another, getting home after dark. But he will always accommodate your call. So, Charles, you can expect a good many calls in the coming week. And he, and he always is willing to help. And that's the Department of Agriculture. And we are part of agriculture. Whether we want to be informal or formal, it doesn't matter. We're part of agriculture and there are tools there to be, to be used. Um, the one slide there, you might see Krista and I uh, did a little, like a little stall, the gazebo, candles and beeswax blocks. And we've got uh, a friend, Pauline, at Nourish Soaps that makes our, our soap. She's got a very good name, a very big market, and she makes soaps for us, which we sell, uh, which has our own honey in. And it's a wonderful, and all along this, you can have so much fun. You really, really can. Uh, candles, um, one can buy the silicon molds and make candles. And we looked at price, and we thought, oh, I'm never going to sell any. And this was like a little church fate thing in Belvedere, beautiful little common. We had so much fun that day. And we made about six grand. Now, what do you normally go, like, do you on a Saturday, maybe go out to your bees and so on, and oh, you've got to get this, you've got your time schedules, you go. But sometimes it's good to sit back in an environment like that and have fun and appreciate the gift that we are given as beekeepers to be able to work with these incredible bees. The, the gift to be able to tell our public in South Africa 
that we have the most unique honeybee in the world, the Cape honeybee. She's a celebrity, you know. She's not a Cardassian. She's not a Taylor trash celebrity. I'm sorry, I've got to say that because it's true. Um, but if I look at Paul with his market, you saw that. That's one of Paul's stands. Oh, no, that's, that's Jeff and Casey Bloom. And that's just outside, I think it's Kachakama, or it's just outside PE. Is that Kachakama? Kachakama? It's just outside Kachakama, just outside. But look at that. That store was amazing. You know, and someone at phone said, okay, you're doing this little thing, you're okay. I said, tell them to pull in. And we just expected a little table. And yeah, they came with this little trailer that actually all folds into each other. Everything folds in, so it's like a pop-up trailer. I thought one of the most beautiful things to, to see, and I, I, I was wondering if I'm going to see something like that. They had record sales that day. It was absolutely fantastic. So you can have so much fun. Now look at my friend Paul, who owns Heathmont Honey um, in, in Melbourne, and he's a one-man operation. He has a little hydraulic lift on the back of his ute or bucky, and that's the way he has to lift the hives up. You can't afford labor, uh, beekeeper labor in Australia. The rate is about, it'll be about 350 rand an hour. Okay, so Paul does it everything. His wife and his kids clap in. But he's a one-man operation. He owns his own house. They have a caravan. They go on two holidays a year with their kids. Kids are at a good school. So it can be done. Uh, on a scale like that. But the one market that they did in, I think it was Christmas, I think it was last, this last year, when they just started lifting restrictions and people in Australia were allowed to walk around again. Um, and they sold 32,000 rands worth of bee products at one market. There's informed, educated consumers out there are starting to move back to the situation of dealing directly with the supplier. It's really, really is, is, is quite a tendency we're seeing. Um, I've said that, and I think I've said my piece because I don't want to overtract. Um, but, oh, um, but more than any of this, more than any of this, Remember, you're working with the most unique honeybee in the world. She's a celebrity. And I'm very sure that if the Cape honeybee could talk to you, she'd say, stop selling my honey at shit prices. <laughs> Start educating your consumers. Bring them to your honey room. Invite them. Give them a free jar of honey. Tell them all about me and my family. <laughs> because I need to be protected and I need you beekeepers to look after me and to protect me, and I need you to sell my products at the price that they deserve. And other than that, the honeybees would say to you, have fun, because that's what it's about. Okay, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what you see there. Um, Andre is going to speak on propolis. Okay, no, that's fine. Okay. There's your... You're going to change the slide? Uh, the, the bottom one.
<laughs> no, you can, you can share. Um, thank you, uh, Rita and the WCBA. Um, I'm a fairly new beekeeper. Um, only started in, it's not here, March 2021. That's when I got my first hive. And I've been doing beeswax uh, byproducts, adding value for the past year. And some of what I'm going to speak about was covered, and hopefully I can bring everything together in terms of how you can add value to your business. Um, I'm going to start off with that phrase, and it says survival of the fittest, and we all tend to believe it means that you need to be the strongest to survive. And that's not necessarily the case. And while watching a presentation by uh, Professor Robert Picard, he made it even better. And that was, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent of us, of species that will survive, but it will be the most adaptable. And that applies not just to the animal species, but to everything really in life, and especially in business. Because if you are not going to be adaptable, you are not going to survive. If you look at companies over the years, no one knows of Lotus 1, 2, 3 anymore. Nokia suffered the same fate. You need to be innovative, you need to change, and you need to be adaptable in the market. And the same applies with us as beekeepers. So I'm extremely nervous, so forgive me, this is my first presentation. Uh, it is, it will go to the next okay. slide. Um, so value added is adding additional value to your products before offering it to your consumers. And in that process, you are going to attract more customers. I had a butcher for a couple of years, and if you go to any butcher and you ask him, who's his best customer? Is it the guy coming in to buy a whole lamb every month, or is it the guy coming in buying cold meats every week for 300 rand? He's making more on the guy coming in to buy the 300 rand cold meats every week, even though the value, the, the rand terms might be more on the whole lamb. And that is the process what we as beekeepers need to understand is the honey is one thing, but there's so much more that we can get out of our bees by adding value and extracting that value for our business. Um, so what is it that the bees provide us with? Uh, and this I'm preaching to the choir here. I'm not going to cover everything, but this, I'm only going to cover the items that, that I'm going to speak about. So we have our honey, and then we have the beeswax, and we have propolis, but there are so much more things. There's pollen, there is uh, royal jelly, there's training and education, uh, tours, ecotourism. So there's so much more that we can extract out of our bees that, that we are not potentially doing. In order to make your products, you need to also have an integrated knowledge, um, in-depth knowledge of what it is that makes your product better. Because people are going to come, to come and ask you, well, why should I use this instead of that? And you need to be able to understand that product in detail, what the benefits are. And we all know the benefits of honey, the antioxidant, active bacteria, all of these natural goodness that, that comes from honey and the phytonutrients. And I'll cover that a bit later on, especially the phytonutrients, phytocompounds found within honey. So you need to understand that in order to sell your product at the end of the day. Beeswax has similar properties to honey, um, and it also contains vitamin A. It's also a humectant, meaning that it retains moisture. So it's good for the skin. It keeps your skin moisturized. So Understanding those properties is very important when you are making your products because you, you, will be, you will be able to better sell those products to your customers. It's also hypoallergenic. And I'm going to just speak on beeswax candles at the moment because we also need to be innovative in the products that we are selling. So when I started looking at making beeswax candles, I did not want to sell beeswax candles because the beeswax was so valuable to me in my other products. But when I did go into styling beeswax candles, everyone was selling hand-rolled beeswax candles. And if you want to attract customers, you also need to be different. So find ways of being different. And these are some of my beeswax candles and you can get the molds, but if you can't find the molds, there's other ways that you can. So, I mean, this year is a cupcake mold, a silicone cupcake mold that I found 
and I make my beeswax candles from that. I have various sizes, so you need to really just think outside of the box. And that allows you to offer so much different things to your customers, because if everyone is selling hand-rolled candles, how are you going to be different? So look at ways, and, and really you need to think outside of the box. So beeswax candles, in terms of the benefits, and, and I did not know this until I really started making beeswax candles, it doesn't leave a chemical residue when it burns. So unlike paraffin waxes and, and soy-based candles, they don't leave a, a chemi um, chemical residue while they burn. Number two, it actually purifies the air. And I did not know this again until I found out, and that is why I now make beeswax candles. So when someone comes to me and asks me, why must I buy a beeswax candle, I can tell them why. And the, the reason behind that is that the dust particles in the air, they are all positively charged. And when the beeswax candle burns, as it burns, it releases negative ions, which gets attracted to the positive dust particles and it makes them heavier and they sink down to the floor. So if you have dust allergies, it's good to burn a beeswax candle for an hour or two hours in your room before you go to bed. There is proven scientific backing behind that. And again, I did not know this until I went to go and research it. And it is also biodegradable. So it's a completely natural product. In order for me to also stand out, I decided to, my wicks in my candles, everyone has got um, cotton wicks. I don't sell my candles with cotton wicks. I went to go and find uh, hemp wicks. And now I can tell my, my clients that I've got a hemp wick in my product, which is different. Hemp burns hotter than cotton. It requires a third of the resources that a cotton plantation would require. And it is also, it doesn't require pesticides. So it's a lot more natural. My complete product ends up being a lot more natural. Coming to propolis, and I think we have someone speaking more in depth about different propolis and, and the ways uh, of extracting it. But again, it's the same properties of um, honey. And there's the 300 phyto compounds that is found within the propolis. And I want to just pause on the propolis quickly because, again, telling that story is so, so important. So bees do not have an immune system like we do. They don't produce antibodies when they are sick. Um, some plants produce the resins, and it's a plant defense mechanism to protect the plants against diseases. So it's got huge antifungal properties. The bees collect these resins and bring it back into the hive for the same reason that the plants are making it. They then will seal the hive up and, and it, it disinfects the hive. Beekeepers, we don't like the propolis because it just makes everything sticky. There's some amazing research by, I think it's Dr. Mahler Spivak. Dr. Marlis Pervac, and if you go and watch some of her YouTube presentations, what she actually did was she took 12 hives and six of them, she took these propolis mats. I don't know if you've seen them, but this is propolis collector mats, and it allows the bees to just collect excess amount of propolis. She took the six beehives and she lined the inside of the hives and under the inner cover with these propolis mats. Six of them. That was so that they could bring in more propolis. And six hives, she left without it. She went to go and infect this, all of the hives with AFB and EFB to see what the bees' reaction would be when they are infected, one with more propolis and one with less propolis. After the whole experiment, she did a spore count. And the spore counts within the hives that had these propolis mats in them was 10 times less than the bees without the propolis. So that already told them they were still sick. They still ended up burning the colonies, but they were healthier than the bees without the propolis or without with the smooth inside hives where the bees were not encouraged to produce propolis. There was another paper published uh, in 2020 where it was found that of the main phytochemicals found within honey, in, in, um, in honey they, don't, they are not found or they are hardly ever found in the plant nectars. So the phytonutrients found within the honey doesn't come from the nectars. 
they are all found within propolis. And that was published in 2020 in the annual review of entomology. So these scientists are doing amazing research. I think outside of humans, the honeybee is the most studied animal out there. So there's tons and tons of research still going on and we're still learning so much more about the, the honeybees. When you make your, your products, and, and this is what is going to make your product different to the next person, and that is going to be your essential oils. And essential oils are basically plant-based extracts, so it's again a natural product. And depending on what it is you want to achieve, you would then go and find out what the benefits of each of those essential oils are. So some of them are anti-inflammatory, some of them are antibacterial and antifungal, and some of them have aromatherapeutic properties. Something like lavender is an aromatherapeutic um, essential oil, eucalyptus is another, and peppermint, but it also has other benefits as well. So depending on the essential oils that you are going to use, that will make your product different to the next. And every, every one of my products contains essential oils. The essential oils that I use mainly, and this is not all of them, but this is my main list that I use within my product range is, um, okay, so that's not an essential oil. Vitamin E I add in all my products because it adds as a preservative for the wax-based products. Um, these are the essential oils that I use, but these are not everything. They, you can use a lot more. Tea tree, for example, is good for your, for your skin. Uh, there's various, so again, look at what it is the product that you want to make. Do you want to make something for hair, for beard balm, beard wax, or do you want to make something for a specific reason? Then you would look at the benefits of those essential oils and, and what they can be used for. Um, I, the next item is your carrier oils and beeswax is hard so you need something to soften and make it um, more easily workable. I also only use um, natural carrier oils. Uh, some of them are examples of cocoa butter, um, avocado oil, grapeseed oil. So these are the carrier oils that I use within my products. I've got sweet almond oil here on my list, but I no longer use that because I don't want to have to put on a nut allergy on my, on my product. So you can use nut-based carrier oils, but you just need to be aware that you need to declare that as a possible allergen uh, for your product that you make. So I have stopped using um, any nut-based oil within my, um, my, my products. And the, so those are not complete. There's a lot more out there. Um, in terms of where to get things like this, most of my stuff I get from a company called Isivuno Naturals, and they're very good. They've got a lot of these products I get from them. The essential oils you can pick up at a pharmacy like uh, Dischem or Clix, they will have a range of, of different essential oils. They are, however, very, very expensive. Um, some of them go for 10 mil for 200 rand and some will be 10 mil for 50 rand. So it does depend on what essential oil you're going to make. Um, and just for a basic recipe, this is for a basic recipe for any one of my products. Um, and it's basically one part beeswax, three to four parts of your carrier oils and that will determine how soft or how hard your product ends up being. So if you want a softer product, you would add more carrier oils. If you want a harder product, you would add less carrier oils. I think my, my hardest product that I have is my uh, beard wax because it's, it's meant to more styling, my beard and hair wax, and that is about 2.5 parts uh, carrier oils. Um, the next thing I add in all my products is propolis because it's just so good. You know, the 300 phytochemicals compounds I add in all my, my products, propolis, um, 1%. And then the last one would be your essential oils. I try and keep my essential oils to between two to four different kinds in any one product. And you don't need a lot. A little goes a very long way. So even if you're paying 200 rand for 10 mil of, of um Essential oil, you're not going to use that whole 10 mil unless you're making a very big batch. But again, 
two to four essential oils is more than enough because you don't want to put in five, six, seven essential oils. It's, it's going to defeat the purpose of what it is you're trying to achieve. Try and keep it as little. Most of mine is about three on average. Um, and that's me and my team at our, at our first, my wife, my son, and my daughter, we're the B team. And uh, my first product was my uh, propolis and my, um, my lip balm. So that is all sitting here. And we've heard the story now about 12, um, 12 um, honeys, 12 bees required to make a teaspoon of honey. This is, this is a piece of honeycomb that I picked up from a new swarm that they built in the space of about six hours. And to put that into perspective, this is four grams of beeswax. Four grams. And the bees would have required the energy from 40 grams of honey to make this. 40 grams of honey. Which means that it's 103 to 105, the life's work of 105 bees to make this. To collect the 40 grams of honey to make this. And they would have gone to 144,000 flowers to collect the nectar required to make this. This two million the nectar of 2 million flowers goes into one jar of honey. So this was 144,000 flowers to make this. So if the honey is our liquid gold, then the beeswax and the propolis is the diamonds of the hive. And we need to refine it and extract as much value as we can from it. So... Thank you so much for your time, and, and I really hope you enjoyed that. Uh, are we going to do questions now or later? No, no. No? Okay. Is there any... <laughs> yeah. How do you make it? you buy it already in a bottle? So my propolis I make myself. Um, I make it in a in an oil and in a tincture with um, with uh, ethanol. So it's either a 70% ethanol mixture or I do it with olive oil. The thing is, I use the olive oil one in my products because it's it, it's an oil based. I don't make any um, emollients. Uh, so emollients are, are water based products, and beeswax is obviously oil based. And making a lotion requires you to add a uh, emulsification agent, which I haven't done yet, but a good emulsifier and natural emulsifier is something like lecithin, lecithin which is a natural um, emulsification agent. So I've done one, which is this one here, and this one has been standing now for about four months, and I used it for my daughter's eczema, but it was actually, it's, it's starting to work on a, but it's a, only a test batch. The two different ones, ethanol and the olive oil. Yeah. <laughs> you, what, you, okay. no, no, thank you very much for your presentation. Unfortunately, I must go. Okay. But one thing you missed about the health. On the bread in this, I, I, I did a quick, in this booklet, everyone you've got there. Uh, let me just check it. <laughs> on page five, you will read, stimulate beekeeping as an hobby. Now, that's very important to health because it helps with your mental health. <laughs> this, it, it does. And, and on that, there was a research study done on a small, it was a small sample, but they studied that beekeepers live on average longer than anyone else. <laughs> they don't know why. They just... <laughs> and then, then just the last remark from this booklet. On page 14, the, the, uh, it gives the fructose as 38 and the glucose as 31, total 69.5. According to literature, it's, it's total 70 to 72 percent. But I must just remind you, most South African honeys, I'm not talking about vo uh, most volume, but I'm talking about most honeys, the, the glucose is much higher than, then, the, than, the, than, the, than the fructose. And that's the reason, that makes it better. That's the reason why it makes it crystallize. Why it crystallize. And yes, crystallized honey is better than liquid honey. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's a question out there. So uh, if there's any questions on the chat, you're going to let me know. Um, I just have a question around um, your carrier oils. 
Do you bulk buy and what is storage like for that if you do? Um, so I bulk buy. Um, bulk buy to me is, is not uh, anything between two kilograms or um, five kilograms. That is what I do. I store them in my freezer because it's just so much better, especially if I'm not going to use them for longer. Um, the carrier, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I don't tend to need to keep them for a lot, for very long, because if I, like I said, you, you use three to four parts. So um, if I'm making a batch of, um, say I'm making a batch of, I make 200 lip bombs at a time, you know, so I'm going to use up most of that in any event. Um, so I don't try and buy too much. I, at the moment, I'm just managing my stock levels. But to keep it long term, it's best to just keep it in a low um, refrigerated uh, temperature because they do melt, especially something like shea butter. It might be hard at room temperature, but if the heat goes up, it will become liquid. Um, but yeah, I, I don't buy anything more than five kilograms at a time. Thank you so much. Ah, oh, there's more. <laughs> Guy that made the TikTok video after they busted that people in Lotus. Yes, I am. I am the guy. One more question. You mentioned Isibono. 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 Uh, they a uh, company that sells these natural products, the carrier oils, and they do some essential oils. My vitamin E I get from them. Um, they're an online. They are based in Cape Town, so you can actually go to this shop and, and pick up the products from them. Uh, I think they're somewhere in the northern suburbs. Isivuno, I-S-I-V-U-N-O, Isivuno. Uh. So essentially natural, it's also a really great online shop. Essential, essential yeah. Natural, yeah, I don't want to promote any one particular. There's so many out there. Vitamin E, vitamin E oil is a great multiplier if you want to make things. Okay. Ah, I had to order it online. So I had to order my hemp wicks from Amazon. I don't have any year now, um, but I ordered from Amazon and really I bought a, a roll like this, like you would find the twine in the shops. And I've made hundreds of candles and I'm not even halfway through that thing. So it lost, it really does last. And it's pre-dipped in beeswax. So it's completely natural, uh, the hemp wick that I buy. Otherwise, sometimes they might pre-dip it in, in uh, soy-based wax or paraffin wax. So I looked for a pre-mixed uh, wick with, that was dipped in beeswax. So just another question. Your molds for the candles, where do you buy that from? I'm struggling. Okay. So if you're thinking of candle-specific molds, I also had to go online. But if you think outside of the box, um, this, this mold for this candle was a cupcake mold that I picked up at a, a local supermarket. Any, and you look at, you find the, so this is, this is, um, I think it was for ice cubes. And if it's silicon based, it's food safe. So you can use it then for your product. So what I do with this was, um, I take a, uh, because I can't now add my wick, I just drill a hole through the middle and I thread my wick through. You know, and then it looks fine. And I've, uh, this one burns for, I won't lie to you, this one burns for four hours. Four hours continuous burn time. Um, and then this is my, obviously from a candle uh, specific mold. You can think outside of the box. I'm going to make my first um, round uh, candle and I'm going to use the Pringleton. So I'm going to make a big pullet candle and I can then just cut it off. So you need to think creatively outside of the box uh, to be able to, to be different, because that will make you unique and get your customers. Oh, sorry, Ahmed. I just want to, um, there's an online question from Colleen, and Colleen wants to know if you, um, if you can just repeat what your percentage ethanol is for the proper listing. So, um, the ethanol that I get is a food safe, food grade, 70% um, ethanol. Um, I can't remember the supplier now. It's a company up in Joburg. They have um, food safe, so I can use it in my products. I make sure I, I buy a food safe ethanol. 70% is sufficient for, for making a tincture. Uh, 
So thank you so much. Wat is dit? Oh, oké. Okay. <coughs> ik heb het niet nodig. Ik heb het niet nodig. Nou, Retourien. Ja, ja. Nee, nee, nee. Uh, Verder, ik heb het niet nodig. Nou, nou, nou. Nog geen nou niet. Dat kan je eens afzetten. Oké. Okay. Of mag ik niet, ja. Als ik dan niet, dan ga ik die zo eerst toe maak. Ik is ze. Ik ga, ik ga. Ik is bij bang voor haar hoor. Ik, ik ga doodstil net hier staan. Um, als ik, ik kijk of ik bij jou regel. <laughs> Want ik heb nog niks om mijn boeken op te zetten. Nog achter toe? Nee, nee, nee. Ik heb het niet zo. Je stemt Oké, kan ik me dan iedere beetje nader komen? Ik heb iedere mijn gezicht in zitten. Oké, okay. hallo allemaal. Ik, is, ik ga me jullie een beetje gezellig. Uh, sorry, ik moet spreken Engels. Oké, okay. mijn focus is going to be on, on biking. And the, all, everything on the stove, everything you do on the stove. My background is home economics. I've been in catering work for Spear for quite a while. So obvious, this is always my passion. And the latest one is cheese making, the honey cheese making. But I'm not going to focus that much on it. Um, today, everything is about giving you the tool to increase your um, your. Extra, as the extra income for you. So I just before I go into the baking, I just want to work on the soft uh, on marketing a little bit. Um, people buy with their eyes, and in most cases, woman is the buyer. The trick for a woman is put it in their hands. They never put it down again. So if you make a, a cream or something. Give them something. Give a sample. Give a something. Don't wait for them to take the sample. Put something on their hands and just feel this. Exactly with baking. You need to lead women and men, the public. You need to lead them with their eyes. You need to, I call it soft marketing. You need to give them an idea what to use it for. Or if they, if they use this, you need to create a need. If they use this product, they actually need it. You need to show them you actually need my product. So this is a soft marketing. This is where Owen said you need to lift your brand. So this is not about, okay, now I bake a cake and there it is. You, you need to check how you package it, how you do the product uh, um, to sell it. Okay, the packaging always needs to be pleasing to the eye, look nice and neat and clear and crisp. People like simplistic things, but it needs to sell. Um, and it's well presented and upmarket. Then the, the story about packaging in glass and packaging in plastic, especially for honey. Um, cakes are something different. Your rusks, rusk, we all know the rusk package. Um, so that's fine, but you need to work on the how you package thing, how you brand. And I'm going to cover the gifts also. So some of the things that I show you now, there's a reason why, because I'm going to cover it, use it in the gifts as well. So, um, and then the biggest thing, whatever they take, they must think, wow, this is now value for money. 
And that's your main purpose. With whatever you do, you need to establish a brand so that later on people will buy because they trust your brand. And then you can put your price up. So um, it's also, for me, I like things to go quick. So I can't waste time. I will always go for a niche market. So when I started, I thought, who is my competition? And I look at the other beekeepers, look around at the products, and I decided, no, I couldn't find anybody that I want to compete with. Um, being an entrepreneur, and I've had other businesses as well before, um, I know what it is to put a business in place, even though it's sm uh, small. Everybody start as a beginner. The biggest trick is to first set where you want to be. Who is your target market? Who is that person? Or what does it look like? And set your goals and up your game from the beginning. So now, if you're small here and there's... Um, so, okay, to give you an example, my target market, I went through everybody and I decide the only one that I want to compete with is Babylon Sturen. And you know why? Their products was nicely packed it looked expensive, so what did they do? They immediately create the, the, a need with me. I mean, I'm clever, I know these things. And they immediately, without being conscious of it, I, they, they, they created that need in me. This is exactly what you guys should do. So Babylon's tour and was my um, uh, competition. I compete with them for two years without them knowing. And then, then I decided, but look, I need to have another brand as well. So currently I have three different brands in my business. I compete against myself with three different brands. Two with the niche market and one for upper market middle class. So I do not work in plastic. I work my glass because glass is class. And there's clever ways um, to work with glass and to, to um, enhance my niche, my branding. And for the uh, online people, I'm going to move away for a few minutes just to get some bottles. Um, let me quickly see. Okay, unfortunately, I share with you the things that I've done last year with my baking and even with my gifts. So you're not competition for me because I'm already two steps in front of you. <laughs> okay. Um, a beekeeper from uh, um, the Southern Cape phoned me last year and he said, look, he's got this honey that he tried to sell for the whole year and he couldn't um, sell it. Um, for, sorry, I'll still cover my, my baking. I'm going to go with it now. No. He, he can't sell it. And I said, well, change your, the way how you present it. Perhaps you fool the people on the other side. So he was presenting his honey in the honey jar that we all know, with the hexagons, the honey. Um, that. Unfortunately, I do not have the jar that I suggested, part of his honey, so I said to him, take this. Uh, filter your honey um, so that it's clear. It's not, you know, you work with raw honey. Sorry, this is the bottle that I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so, so he, he filtered his honey so that it's clear. It's this time of the year, holiday season. So I said to him, whenever you display your honey, make sure there's a light at the back that reflect onto this honey. So he had this different, just uh, different honeys in his jars. The same honey with a higher price. And he phoned me within a week and he said, everything is sold out. So just change sometimes when something doesn't sell. There's a reason. Or, uh, and he uh, labeled it as choice great. But just the look. That's why I said we buy with our eyes. Check what you're doing. And they need to feel value for money. So there's different bottles. I work, uh, depends on what I do with different bottles. This will do this uh, exactly the same thing. You just bring a cheaper, um, a cheaper price in. For somebody that do not want to buy the higher price, but bring a uh, so play around with your your packaging. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm just gonna quickly on that. 
I just want to take everything away, sorry. Okay, last on packaging, the last group. Um, this is still on the honey and then I go away. So, uh, I'll stop with that. Now this is really, it's, it's a cheap thing. It's a, it's a cheaper, yeah, thank you. It's a cheap, in my eyes, a cheaper, because it's not really, this, this doesn't look classy. So I had to work really hard to work with this to suit my brand. Not even my top brand, because I will not bring this into my top brand. Um, and we got a guy that had a very clever way uh, with wood and make that like uh, 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 a monkey for me. But we spray, yeah, we spray it in solar so nobody can see that it's wood. But it was hooking this thing here, like this. So you can still work, and this was my tasteless bas basket. So in the end of the little basket was a little um, Rona circle key. Translate somebody, please. Rona yeah, for, for the gentleman. Just circle, just the, for the gentleman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the, uh, so, and there I had this little role where I explain all my honeys. What is the properties? What? So it was like a taster basket. One side was this explanation and the other side was my honey uh, my different tasting sticks so it was like a honey experience I call it my honey experience basket so this is clever ways of doing the same thing and I actually this bottle cost me more per gram than my my top markets uh, more most expensive honey so there's clever ways of doing things like this uh, somebody at a, a one man's taster pack and this is what they use in that so uh, there's ways of, um, for my top market, this is the one that I use for the taster packet, um, for the taster, uh, my taster thing. And it need to be well presented, it need to look expensive, because this is my top brand. So just ways, and this is what I pack ice cream in. I make honey ice cream and I sell it in the shops. I do not sell in proper, because this is my niche market. So it needs to be cut above the rest, different. Um, they repeatedly say, do something different than the next one. People will go to your shop and they will see like, lip balm, lip balm, lip balm. Oh, it's new, it's old, old. Uh, you don't even look further. But the minute when you call your lip balm something else, they will think, I haven't seen this. So what is this? Let me test it. You need, you need to get a showstopper name and there's more around the brand. Okay, I'm just going to put that away and then I'll, I'll, I'll speak to you for more. We're going to go into the rest of the things. Okay, um, I said that you should use the soft marketing and uh, um, need to think and what can, uh, what is the correct product size for that market? Know your market. Always observe. It's, it's good if you can, wherever your market is, sometimes just be there, listen what people say. And because th this is obviously, I found that um, if you are in the shop, your sales is like in four or five times more when you're not in the shop. Um, and I said to you, you must look at the packaging and bottles. Then something else, after COVID, uh, people are more health conscious than ever before. So another um, open area for us in South Africa, it's a brakland, we call it in Afrikaans, homemade uh, preservatives like in canned, honey canned uh, fruit and um, canned fruit and things like that. There is no, nobody d do it in, in, in a large scale. I'm beekeeper. And then I have to come back and I have to do all my housework, extract everything and still do my product. So my market is very, um, I can't go that big. I don't want to go that because I want to control everything. I don't trust my husband but my bees. I want to do it myself because um, he don't work like, like me, uh, what I want to do. And so me and my worker, we, we're similar but we like to work with our ladies. 
and then I still had to extract and come and do my my brand. So so my market is niche, well established because I know what I want. I know what I want to bring over and only work for that. And I decided to open a shop a few years ago, and I realized no no no, who, who am I going to put in the shop and who's going to work the bees? Where I want to be in the shop, but I also want to be the bees. So. I went to one of the other shops in my area and I give some of my ideas for them. So sometimes you can go there and check what happened. So um, yeah, within a week, it was one of the top sellers. So I thought, okay, now you're the top. Now I need to get to the top again. So I need to better my product, better the thing that I gave them. So uh, it's very easy to, if you're not the top, it's very easy to take somebody else's idea and make it bigger and better. But to be on top with your brand is the most difficult thing because you always need to be two steps in front of the guy who's going to copy you. And that's the most difficult part. Okay, um, baking, stoves and everything. We talked about people that is more healthy. I found that my all of a sudden my uh, mueslis was selling like mad. You know, I never ever before made any muesli. And I thought, how the hell are I going to do? I knew from, from when I studied that muesli is actually a thing that uses a lot of honey. So very easy recipes for making muesli. And, and I thought, okay, now how, how am I going to pack it that people will be different, that my product will be different than the rest? So I made this um, like a cone. I went to, to a packaging company and I said, look, I'm very small. I do not want to pay a lot. I bargain with everybody. Um, I do not want to pay a lot. I don't have the money, but I've got a bloody good product. So in the end, they made me this. Um, it's not a cellophane. It's a pl plastic, but it's, a, it's a actually a very exp expensive thing. But it's like a cone, and in the top, you, you flip it all together. So we decided to do a trial at one of my um, shops where I sell my products. And it uh, was taken out, uh, they bought it immediately. We, we realized we need to change a little bit in the labeling because listening to what people say, there was the label was just not grand enough. Just not that. So we twinched the label a little bit and it just come in the next day with another label and from then on, yeah, um, I regularly had to do different mueslis. <laughs> muesli bars are very easy to make. Everybody's healthy conscious. They, they want a snack in the handbag, snacks for kids. So you can start working on um, a muesli bar, say for instance, the, the runners, the cyclists, uh, for cyclists, you can, for uh, the school package. And you can do different, um, um, different types of muesli bar, honey nuts, Remember, there's always the food requirements that you need to specify when it's um, allergy, anything that is allergy. Uh, um, you can do the chocolate, play around with the products. Then we go to drinks. Um, I've got a, a pomegranate syrup and lemon juice is always a good one. I've got the rooibos lemonade there, which I'll later during tea serve for you guys. Dress it up. What I did with Last year was a very hot summer, so I sold my, I started with a lemon juice because I've got a lemon tree and I, I didn't know how to sell it. We sell it in the long, the long neck bottles like that one here, but the one with the long bottle, the water bottle with the long neck, because that suit my, the image of my niche market. But my upper class middle, and remember from now on, you need to think gift sets, gift sets. This is now your best time to make money packing gift sets and things for Christmas and small ideas where people can buy us Christmas gifts. So with that, so it was last year this time and I then start buying this falia. Ooh, I didn't bring it. The small, the small falia piborokis, you know it. Um, and I start making the honey in that, uh, the, the lemon juice in that and with instructions how to use it. And then one guy bought himself a bottle and he opened it and uh, while I was in the shop and I realized, no, 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 there's a market for me. So then I, after that, I mix it as a fully mixed, already mixed lemon juice. 
and chill it ice, ice cold. In, I put it on ice so that whenever they come into the shop, it's hot outside and serious, it's 45. Uh, well, Rubik was where I was at that stage, 43, 45 during that week. So we, we lay them open in ice buckets and every person that come in, first take that and then they go and pay. So first take the drink. So that was clever ways of selling your things. Um, as I said, it's season time. It's gifts. Any gift with a, with a, a, what is the thing? Lyles. What is Lyles? Golden syrup. You can replace it easily with honey. So look at your cookies. What you pack, how you pack it. And then you can start work around that honey fruit cakes. I brought the chocolate fruit cake, which we try to cut up for you in smaller pieces so that you all can taste it. Um, the men that is in the bee association, they all know that uh, they all know my chocolate cake. Um, and this chocolate cake I made with cream canola today. But sometimes uh, orange, the lemon, the orange honey, um, yeah, the uh, lemon, what do you call it? Orange, blo orange blossom honey is actually very nice with chocolate. I do not like sugar gum with chocolate. I do not like, it's too strong. But forest red in my area work well. Double key work quite well with chocolate. And now, you know, if you, if you double key with, and then what I do with my glaze, or my, my uh, garnishing of the chocolate cake, you, you make honeycomb. And that's beautiful with that, this, cre uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's very nice. So you can, you can uh, play around with it. Um, canning and sauces, tomato sauce. I've got a good tomato sauce recipe. So you can replace, remember with every baking and all these, like a I take a normal tomato sauce re recipe that I always use. So you go to fruit or veg and say to them, look, I'll buy all your tomatoes that's going off. And you're doing your tomato sauce with that. You normally get the five kilogram tomato sauce uh, or tomatoes and the, uh, um, I'll give you the recipe and you can work on that. If people buy your tomato sauce once, you will always have a market for the recipe that I've got. Now, the easy way to sell it is give a sample out. So what do you do? You use that small bottle and hand out a sample. They will come, or they will even taste it on their fingers, and they will buy it. They will buy it. They will, and it's less sugar, because you can replace the sugar, the honey with the, uh, the sugar with the honey. In baking, the rule of thumb always is in baking, for every cup of honey that you replace, uh, every, every cup of sugar that you replace, you will uh, use three quarter cup of honey because honey is uh, more um, uh, uh, sweeter than sugar. And then you will um, <coughs> reduce the, the fluid with a quarter cup. So if there's baking, if it's a baking product, then you had to add a quarter teaspoon of baking powder as well. Because honey is naturally uh, um, acidic. Yeah, it's, it's very acidy. And, and the baking powder, um, you, you need to give extra baking powder to balance that a little bit. Okay? No, no, you increase. Increase with a quarter teaspoon. Quarter teaspoon. Yeah. You reduce with a quarter cup. Because honey's got um, water in it already. So that's very easy. So from now on, you can use any. And then oven temperature. You have to reduce that. Otherwise, the sugar will burn and, and it will burn easily. So uh, my cakes and things, I always bake at 150 degrees for my oven. But you must check your oven um, and just watch it. So, but my, like the mustards, I do not buy mayonnaise, I make my own. So this mustard that I've got here is a mayonnaise based, which I made myself. And I replace all, uh, replace all the sugar in the mayonnaise and the, and the mustard with honey. Uh, with, uh, that one was um, forest red. Okay. Also, some ideas with the food. You're thinking of um, going for Christmas. So spreads like the bacon jam, I've got it here. Or I'll give you the tomatoes, um, 
the cherry tomato spread, which is very nice. Now, if you have to give a gift, you will give the gentleman a bottle of wine and his bacon spread and make small um, wafers that uh, cookies, like a drawer cookies, like, uh, yeah, cheese straws is a very, so this immediately is a gift. Now, I go, well, I'll, I'll cover that in the gift area. Okay, um, I said to the containers, uh, check what you, your, what you sell the product in, so your spreads will always be in a bottle with a big, big opening, like your bacon jam. Okay, okay. These two packaging, this is bacon jam. This is something that you will, it's like a, but yeah, 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 what you will do like in um, a salt, a very delicate salt tart, uh, something like that, you will use this. A spinach and, and feta and the mushroom quiche, you will use this as an extra with. But now you can, a, a good cheese like a camembert, you add this with, and your wafers, and you've got something, your cookies, and your cheese straws, you've got a dip. So this is actually a very nice one, but this packaging is wrong. Why? Look at the opening. If they had to pick it, but this is an order, so I can't change it, unfortunately. She wanted this, this bottles. Um, so I, the, this is an order, but I've, I keep the other one, so I'll open this one for you guys to taste. This is my um, mustard. I like the, I actually have got orders for the bigger bottle as well. And my tomato sauce is in a long bottle. You, you can play around with your packaging. Okay. Um, I said, always keep in mind when you package your things, when you bottle it, the value for money. So it doesn't help you to pack in the imported bottles. So now your bottle costs you 50 rand. And say for instance, your product is also 50 rand. Then it's 100 rand, say for instance, for this. And then you still have to put your, your profit with. It's no, no use. So always keep in mind the cost of your product. I always will do a, a, a product brand. So for instance, I make the honey mushroom. I know my old clients who know this product. So I'll put it in a bottle that I know will sell them to them. But then I will always do the value adding thing. Um, the people that does not know my product. So this is, a, this is also imported bottle, but this is a cheaper bottle than my others, and this is a cheaper bottle. I even had a smaller one. So check how you present. <coughs> Up there. Okay. Nearly finished. Um, yeah, as I said, different flavors of honey, married different um, flavors of products. In, in you, can't, you can't put a strong flavor honey like eucalyptus with a, a subtle, other flavors you need to check what you do there if you can get plum honey it's one of the best honeys to work with in a kitchen fruitcake recipes for Christmas and then um, also for the thank you teacher you can do the fruitcakes in or even the chocolate cake in the tuna tins so you got this miniature cakes which is really value for money and if you if you do extra thing with your fruitcake a little bit a bottle of honey then you've got a teacher thing. There's ideas with, with that. When you do baking, I'm going to give you a spread for all your products. Instead of spray or cook, use this because nothing will stick again. But this is especially with, with your honey products. You use like either, you use one of each. So it's either a half a cup of uh, baking butter, of which Spar has got the best. It must be above 70 80% uh, uh, fat, half a cup of margarine, um, sorry, baking butter, uh, oil, like a cooking oil, half a cup is the same, and half a cup of uh, cake flour. Mix it, you spread your pans, and nothing will stick again. So I've, um, it's either you use a cup of everything or half a cup of everything, but one, one measure um, baking margarine, one measure oil. Um, baking or cooking oil, and one measure cook fl uh, cake flour. Yeah, mix those, keep it in the fridge, and you've got it. Okay, then your rusks. Okay, there's mine in the, uh, this is my honey rusk. This is my basic recipe. I've got five different rusks that I do, 
but this one is the most uh, popular one. So uh, this range has got different flavors. I've got a tropical, I've got a Mediterranean, and I've got a, um, honey nuts, and I've got, um, um, what is the other one, a diabetic one as well. So you can play around with, with the basic recipe and just how you add nuts, uh, different uh, fr dried fruit, you can play around with it. Uh, and as, as I said, it's cheaper because you can make your own muesli, which is cheaper than shop muesli. So yeah, I'll give that recipe for you. Always bake with 80% with butter or margarine. Okay, this rask recipe I will give to um, uh, you. Can Those of you who are interested can get it from me. I've compiled a little booklet, which I'm out of my booklet now. I don't know. Who. It's gone. Okay, I've got a comp uh, compiled a little booklet. I do not want to print it to everybody because, yeah, it was hectic last night. So those of you that want the recipes, you can contact me, give your name or give you your email address and I'll email it to you. Uh, um, just a little bit about the business. Again, be careful to go to people, uh, uh, to other beekeeper shops and copy what they do. Just be careful. Um, I think it's best if you use your own initiative. I, didn't, I never copied other beekeepers. As I said, I copied, I go to the shops because I do baking. I check what other people do. I, ch I like it to check what the olive people do. Um, when they have an olive oil bot butter, then I go and check if I can have a honey butter. When they have something, then I check if I can do that with honey as well. Instead of go and copy uh, other beekeepers' thing, uh, products. So, so, and then stay ahead. Always look, if you always go to somebody else's negative energy, you, will, you check and you actually steal. To me, it's very negative. I find that be your creative juices, and I always said I do, I'm not creative, not at all. But being with other people, sharing ideas, your small idea, you do not take their recipes, but your small idea with their input actually becomes something very big. Or just by being with people, normally if I'm in a group like this, I drive with a little black book in my car because as I go out and it's, I become more relaxed, the ideas will come, just pour new ideas. So this is a, a way that you can um, st st steal but with a positive way. As I said, by always looking what others do, I normally believe you walk into a lamppost. You're so busy checking what others do. Your head is like this and like this, and you never, you did not see the, the opportunities coming to you because you're so busy stealing. If you focus and you sit down and ideas are always pouring in, but you need to make sure what is exactly th that thing that will sell. It's sometimes better to focus only on one or two um, to begin with, one or two strains and go for that. But now the best is for Christmas season with that in mind. So with that said, I'm going to go straight into the gifting. Now you need to open the presentation. <coughs> and with the, yeah? So can I ask a yes, can you do yes, yes. Um, I, I did try it once, but I increased the gelatin. Well, it was with the, I increased not the gelatin from I, I use a, a apple thing there. Yeah, pectin. But I increased it. It worked because I, I can't handle jelly. I don't like it, but I use it in trifles and things like that. So yes, it worked for that. Oh, jam jelly. Yeah, 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 yeah. That you can do because obviously your fruit will have the pectin already for the jelly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. There's a lot of nice recipes on that. Okay. But you know, here, here. Okay. For the next, uh, for my next talk is the uh, is the gifts. So I've Charles. Kijk, how far is my my recipe? I just want to, I just want to listen to you that I thought about while she was having this presentation in terms of your product. You speak about it a little bit like this. Um, instead of developing products, you're trying to 
Oh ja, hij moet ook kies. The client is looking for a solution to a problem, not for a product. So think about it in this way. In your shop or your online store, you're not selling products. You're selling a solution to a problem. And if you think about it a little bit differently from that perspective, you're going to come up with products for your clientele. Because what perhaps might sell um, to my market might not necessarily sell to your market because I am, I am providing a solution to the problems of my clientele. And your market might not have the same problem. So if you change the way you think about it, you can use the same thing. You can use the same thing. You can use the same thing. What do you solve? Thanks, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, just talk about. Um. Alright, um, it's now 11 o'clock, so it's tea time. So I think. <laughs> <laughs> and then after tea. Yeah, you can eat. Okay, I'm going to go out and there is cookies. There 